Hello, everyone. Today, we're going to go ahead and have a live session about magnetism and maybe electrostatics. We will see how long getting through the magnetism material takes. I am not going to cover a lot of the kind of like plug and chug things in terms of equations. But if there is something that you're like, oh, Chris, you didn't cover this and you want to see it, please do let me know. And I will go ahead and do my best to kind of go through that material. But let's go ahead and get started. We're going to kind of start with this like really big picture overview of what is going on with magnetic fields. So we'll talk about kind of what magnetic fields are, how they're produced, and then kind of at the end, we'll also look at what they do. So magnetic fields have strength and they have direction. We can describe strength in terms of these equations, and the equations are just for different things that are generating the magnetic fields, which would either be in a wire or that could be a straight wire, circular wire. They also have direction. Um, they can point in three dimensions, so up, down, to in di two different sides, as well as in and out of our page. And this is where we kind of get to the first right-hand rule, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail. And they're gonna be produced by moving charges. So anytime a charge moves, it's going to produce a magnetic field, which is why when we were looking at before, we're talking about the strength. We were talking about the strength in the context of some sort of wire, whether that was in a circular wire or a straight wire. And they exert forces on other moving charges. And we can describe both the strength and the direction. And this is where we have more of our like plug and chug type things with the QVB sine theta, as well as the second right-hand rule. We're going to, before we move on and look at the right-hand rules, which is usually what gives people most um, of the most trouble with this material, we're going to kind of dive into each of these different ones a little bit more detail. We're going to skip strength because, again, this is kind of like plug and chug, making sure that you have the right equation for the right type. We're going to look at direction. I specifically want to look at in and out of the page because, from my experience, this is usually where students tend to struggle a little bit more is remembering when is something going out of the page, when is something going into the page, so on and so forth. So the way that I always remember this, and it's a little morbid, but hopefully it'll at least stick, um, is that we're going to be firing an arrow, right? We're talking about an arrow. If we fire an arrow, we can imagine this fletching, which is sort of what we're seeing there in red, is forming an X. And that's what you would see if you fired the arrow away from you. You would see that X fletching traveling away from you. So anytime you see a series of X, that means that it's going into the page because that would be the direction that is going away from you. On the other hand, if we have an arrow that's coming towards you, we can imagine that this arrow comes towards you and it hits you in the eye. What would you see? Well, you wouldn't see anything. You would see just black dot. That's kind of how I remember it. You would see a black dot. So anytime you see black dots, they're white in this case because it's on a black background. Um, but anytime you see black dots, you would end up seeing that's when it would be coming out of the page and towards you. It's kind of how you can remember which direction a magnetic field is going when it gets into the sort of non-standard dimensions or like that third dimension, not just the ones that are sort of flat on your page. Um, we're not really going to talk too, too much about these things being produced by moving charges. That's kind of just those equations. And they also exert forces on other moving charges. And this is where we get into a distinction between the two different right-hand rules. So this first right-hand rule, and we'll go over this again, these are going to describe the magnetic field direction. The second right-hand rule tends to describe the force that that magnetic field exerts on some other charge. So that's the difference. The first right-hand rule is going to describe the direction of the actual magnetic field. And the second right-hand rule is going to describe the force that is exerted on some sort of moving charge by a magnetic field. And this is usually where it gets a little bit tricky is we get into these two right-hand rules and people usually get a little bit lost. Now, I apologize, I can't really draw hands and I'll be doing my best to sort of demonstrate some of this stuff as we're going through by drawing in some hands here. Um, but you'll have to just bear with my poor drawings throughout. Um, when we are sort of looking at these two right-hand rules, when we're dealing with wires, Wires are what produce magnetic fields because wires have moving charge in them. That would be via really electrons, but we're going to be talking about current since physicists back in the day incorrectly thought that positive charges were moving throughout these things. Um, we'll also talk about the second right-hand rule, and that's going to be this situation over here on the right-hand side. This is dealing with the force that's exerted on some particle. And this is usually where people get a little bit lost. But what I'm going to do 
is I'm gonna teach this in a little bit different of a different way because from my experience, what I have personally found is that the right hand rules themselves are actually fairly easy. It's more in the fact that they've not been taught super, super well, in my opinion. So most people are pretty good with the first right hand rule. We would say that our thumb is gonna point in the direction of current and then our fingers are going to end up um, showing us the direction of the magnetic field. Um, and that's true, right? So usually we're going to be talking about curling our fingers around the wire, and we'll look at that in a little bit more depth and detail. But if we take this first right-hand rule that most people are pretty good with, and we actually keep the orientation the same, and when I say keep the orientation the same, I mean we're going to go ahead and keep the moving charge, because that's just what current is, on our thumb, and we're going to keep the magnetic field on our fingers, then we can translate this over to the second right hand rule. And what happens here, um, if you're like me and you can't like get your finger to bend right, like this finger is supposed to point like that, it's just really hard for me. Um, then I always treat my palm as where the force is coming from. But it's the same thing, like this finger here is just like the force. And then everything else is literally just carried over from the first right hand rule. Fingers are always going to be magnetic field. Thumb will always be mag uh, moving charge, whether that's current or not. So if we're looking at this in a wire, and if we're looking at it in a wire, what we would be doing is we would be finding what is the magnetic field generated by this current. So to do this, we would take our hand, we would take our um, right hand thumb, point it in the direction of that charge. So that would point like this. This would then be our fingers. Our fingers would be sort of pointing up. And then if we curl them, we would just take it and then curl them. They would curl down and around sort of like this. And so in this particular instance, what this would mean is that if we drew, drew the direction, it would be going circling around this in the direction of our finger. So it'd be coming up and over just like our hand was. And then it would be going down and looping around like this. And this would be throughout the entire wire. It would be sort of making this direction. Let me get rid of this arrow because I think that's a little bit confusing. So sort of like that. Um, usually people are fine with this kind of direction if you're not, and this is sort of confusing. Please just let me know, put something in the chat. I'll try and keep an eye on it as we're going through this periodically. Make sure that hopefully, um, if, if there is a a bit of confusion that we get it cleared up before it kind of compounds. But for now, let's go ahead and move on to this next piece. So here, I'm gonna use some like non-standard stuff. We're gonna think about our previous directions and this X is gonna represent current rather than a magnetic field. So in this case, we have to decide where's the current going. So remember, if it's a circle, that's like we got our eye poked out, that would be coming at us. So this must be going into the page because we fired that arrow and now we're seeing the X of the fletching. So in this case, we have to think about doing this in sort of different directions. We're going to be pointing our thumb into the page. So we're going to point our thumb into the page, which for me would put my thumb on this side, sort of pointing like this. And then over on this, we would go ahead and wrap our fingers up and around. So our thumb is sort of like pointing in to the page. And then our fingers would come wrapping around like this here. And again, I apologize about this horrendous drawing. So if we were gonna draw what this would look like, we would just follow the direction of our fingers and it would look like this when we come around. And there's a question. So just to clarify, the right hand movement should be used to demonstrate the movements of electron in a wire. So that is one usage of the right hand rule. And it's not the movement of electrons in a wire. It is the magnetic field that is generated by a current. So for example, if we're looking at this one here and it's sort of going to be circling around, we would say this wire, if it's oriented so that we're seeing it end on and it is sending the current in the direction of into the page, then there would be a clockwise magnetic field that was circling outwards around this particular wire. So in this instance, for wires, it's going to describe a magnetic field that is being generated by that wire. Hopefully that clarifies that up. So far, we've only looked at wires when they're straight. Now we're going to go ahead and look at what happens when they're in loops. And honestly, it's really not any different. Um, except here, when we deal with loops, we're going to be specifically focused on what is in the center of this loop because the center point is kind of special. It's the one area where it's consistent. Nothing really changes here. 
all I've done is just indicate the direction that we're dealing with when it comes to the uh, current. You can pick any area along this. I've marked out what I think are the four easiest ones to look at. That's the one that's like directly to the top, directly to the bottom, directly to the left, directly to the right. You don't need to do two of these. I'm gonna show you all four, just so you can see that it doesn't actually matter where you choose to put your hand when you're thinking about it. But um, it's also sort of for practice as well. So if we were using this one over here directly on the right, we would point the right hand thumb up like this. This would mean our fingers would be wrapping around. Oh my goodness, this drawing is so terrible. And coming up. So if we were to draw it like this, we would say, okay, the electric, or sorry, the magnetic field comes up and then it ducks back around. And then if we were to slide our thumb along and we now point it in this direction, our palm would be facing away from us. We would be wrapping our fingers and our fingers would be getting wrapped down and around and they would be coming up the other direction. So what we're sort of seeing here is the back of our hand and it's going back and around. So in this case, if we were to again draw it, this would be coming up, down and around and then coming back up the other side and coming up. So you're already beginning to see some um, consistency here, right? This was coming up and around out of the center. This is coming up and around out of the center. And we could basically say, okay, well, up and around out of the center here and up and around out of the center here. And this will be true for literally any point along this entire thing. We can continue to basically take this exact same thing that we've found at one spot and it's never gonna change. It's essentially just going to be consistent throughout. Well, what does this mean? in terms of the magnetic field that's in the center? Well, it's coming towards us, right? It's sort of looping out and around, which means it would be coming towards us. So if we were gonna draw in the magnetic field for this, we would draw it in as a series of circles. Because remember, again, if the magnetic field comes with its arrow and pokes your eye out, you will not see anything but a big black dark circle. So. The method in terms of how we find the magnetic field has not changed at any point in time as we're looking at this. The only thing that has changed is the fact that we are considering not what's around the wire per se, but what is in the center part of this loop because that ends up being consistent throughout. So as I was saying, most people, most people are okay with this application of the right hand rule. And where things begin to fall apart a little bit is when we move on to the second right hand rule, which is gonna describe a different scenario. So previously we were looking at determining a magnetic field. In these other situations, almost always, probably not always, but almost always, you're gonna be given a charge, its direction of movement, and a magnetic field. And what you're typically gonna be asked is in which direction does this particular charge get pushed, i.e. where does the force impact it? And one thing that we're gonna note is we're gonna look at positive charges throughout all of this first, because these right-hand rules are really designed to describe positive charges, and we'll talk about what happens when we're dealing with negative charges. So let's recap the previous right hand rule that we had been using, the one that most people understand. So if we're looking at a right hand and we have our palm facing us, we have our thumb and it's pointing like this, and then here is our hand. What we had been doing previously is we said that this would describe the current. Well, current is again, just like moving charge. So this is going to be the charge movement and we'll go ahead and label it like this. And previously, what we had is we also had the magnetic field and the magnetic field was coming out of our fingers and we're not gonna change any of this. So the magnetic field will still be pointing out of our fingers. The only thing that we add, and I, use the, I do this using my palm, is going to be the force. So whichever direction your palm faces, this is going to be the force that is exerted on this particular particle. So for example, if we were trying to line this up here, we would begin first by taking our thumb and we're going to point it in the direction just like before, just like we were going to do this for the wire in the direction of this movement. So our thumb would be pointing like this. 
Now what we need to do, and this is where it can get a little bit awkward, because if I'm doing this, I kind of have my hand pointing into my screen, my thumb is pointing up towards the ceiling. We need to rotate our hand around this thumb. So this thumb has to keep pointing up. We can rotate it like this, we can rotate it like this, um, and we have to make our fingers point to the right. So I just rotate them, and now we ask ourselves, where is our palm facing? Wherever our palm is facing, I want you to imagine that you're pushing that charge. That is that force. So for example, in this case, I would be pushing this into the page. So if I draw this out with my crappy hands again, we would end up having the back of our hand like this. Our fingers are pointing in this direction, like that there. And then we would be pushing this charge. So the charge, and I don't know exactly how to draw this, would be going into the page as it moves upwards. Typically, you're not going to necessarily see these ones that have like the arrows drawn like this because it's a little bit hard to kind of represent what's going on. What's going to be a little bit more typical will be a situation that's like this, where we have the X's and the O's, and we have to figure out where the charge would be moving in this case. And you'll see why it's a little bit easier to figure this out. So let's just kind of go through the exact same steps. So we know our thumb is going to begin by pointing in the direction of the moving charge as it would have pointed in the direction of the moving current. So our thumb points there. And now we've decided these are X's. Is this going into or out of the page? So remember, if it comes out of the page, it pokes our eye out and we can't see anything but black dots. We can see stuff, we have X's. That's the fletching of our arrow going away from us. So we need to rotate around our thumb. Our thumb is pointing to the right. We need to take our hand and rotate it so that our fingers point into the page. So when I do this, my hand would be facing um, into my computer and now my palm is facing up towards the ceiling. And remember, we're just gonna imagine that I just go ahead and I just lift that positive charge straight up. So I'm not gonna probably be able to draw this super well, but hopefully you can kind of imagine this is sort of how my fingers are um, if I'm drawing my bad hand. And then this is coming straight up and that's where I push this. So if we're thinking about the trajectory of this thing, it has some velocity in the rightward direction, and now it's also gonna have some velocity in the upward direction. So the overall sort of movement of this thing would be curving towards this direction as it passes through this magnetic field. Any questions so far? Hopefully this is all kind of making sense and you can see the relationship between the two right hand rules. And if we're able to essentially hook on to the fact that that first right hand rule is a little bit easier, I think it makes the second right hand rule a little bit easier to implement as well. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, do one more example. And when we look at this example, we're gonna talk about, well, what happens if we're dealing with things that are negatively charged? Because at this point in time, we've done everything with a positive charge. So now we'll look at what happens if we have a negative charge. Again, same exact scenario. We're gonna go ahead, we're gonna take our thumb. We are going to point it in the direction of the moving charge. So for me, again, that would be pointing this to the right. But this time, right, we're getting our eyes poked out. We need our fingers, which are the magnetic field, to point towards us. So I'm going to sort of, it's kind of awkward, um, but I'm going to basically point my fingers straight at me. And what I see is that my palm and my hand is starting to push down. So I would like be scooping this thing up and I would be pulling it straight down towards the floor. So again, if I try and draw this out, what I kind of have here is so bad at this. My fingers are sort of like curling over. <laughs> that doesn't even look like a hand. Um, and then I would be pushing this thing sort of straight down like this. And so if we were to take a look at the trajectory of what would we get when we pull this down, we would get a particle that as it enters this particular field would be curving, let's put some blue, would be curving downwards. Now, what I said is that previously, everything that we have been describing describes a positive charge. So what happens if, hey, we're dealing with an electron, we're not dealing with something that's positively charged? It's actually really easy. Just use your right hand rule like you normally would. So we've already done that step. And if it's a negative charge, instead of thinking about your palm, I want you to think about whacking that particular charge with the back of your hand. So we sort of palm our positive charges. So it's P for P, palm positive, And then we backhand our negative charges. It doesn't work in terms of like the, you know, P and P thing, but it's good enough because I usually can remember, if I remember one instance, I know the other is the opposite. So if we had our hand pointed like this and we're gonna backhand it, well, this would push it in the exact opposite direction. And so the trajectory, which I'll put in red, would be curving up towards the ceiling as it travels to the right. 
So you don't need like a separate, you know, hand rule for negative charges per se. You basically just use the exact one that you've already been using with just that one little modification. So hopefully this kind of makes these right hand rules a little bit easier in terms of how to implement them, what they're for. I do want to look at one more example. And we're going to talk about um, mass spec with this example, because I think it's just kind of nice to look at a real world example, especially since they will often ask you about some sort of real world example. So when do you know whether or not to do the right or the left hand? So I would just always use my right hand. I never use my left hand. And I just remember that if it's negative, I'm going to use the back of my right hand to predict it. That way I don't have to try and think about right versus left hand. I just always use right hand. And I suppose if you don't have a right hand and you only have a left hand, then you would basically just reverse everything that I've said. So like all the rules would work if you only have a left hand. You would just reverse all of the um, rules. But yeah, basically... I just use my right hand rule and then if it's negative, you just do the reverse of what you had normally been doing for positive charges. So that's why I was talking about like the um, P for palm. So if it's positive, it's your palm. And if it's negative, it's the back of your hand for the rule. But everything else stays the same in terms of your thumb as well as the fingers in terms of where they point. The only thing that changes is the force for positives is in your palm and then the force for negatives is the back of your hand. Or you can just reverse it. It's just kind of how you want to think about it. Um, so let's say we were looking at this and let's imagine that what we're seeing here is mass spec. So there was a ion gun that basically ionized and created these two fragments. Each of these fragments have the same charge. So we'll just say like, okay, you have a plus one charge. You also have a plus one charge, but the difference between these is that this is a really high mass. And then this is a low mass particle. Let's go ahead and figure out what's going to happen to these particles when they go in. Let's just deal with direction first. So we're talking about the force. Um, and we take our thumb and we point it in the direction that this is moving. This is moving to the right just like before. We have those X's that's going away from us. So our palm points to the ceiling. Both of these are going to get pushed towards the ceiling. So that we know, right? We can say that these are going to exert or get some force on them like this, which is why we get that sort of like resultant vector that looks something like this here. But here's the difference between these two. If a force pushes on something with more mass, and this would presumably be the same force, why is it the same force in this case? Because the charge is the same, and the charge is sort of what would be determining the force, not the mass of it. So for example, if one of these was plus two, it would experience a larger force. But because they have the same charge, they both experience the same magnetic force that's being pushed onto them. But you can imagine if you were to say push with a 10 Newton force on like an itty bitty tiny pebble, that thing's gonna go like flying across the room. But if you do it with some like ginormous boulder, that thing is not going anywhere. So in mass spec, what happens is these really light particles, these less massive particles, they bend a ton. And these, particle, these particles with much greater mass, they don't bend as much. And so they're gonna end up over here. And what the detector does, which is say like right here when these things hit, it knows to say, oh, this particle right here, this was a lower mass. And this particle, because it bent way less, this is higher mass. Now it does things on the basis of the mass to charge ratio. So this would actually be a MZ. We just chose to focus on the mass element, but hopefully now you can sort of have more understanding also why mass spec works the way it does and why that bending actually kind of goes into this. I will not be discussing the M plus one, et cetera, because this is really just about magnetism. I just kind of want to describe this one element of it. Um, but if people did want a mass spec, um, video, I actually do have a lot of the visuals and almost the script ready for that. So that is something that I could probably put out here somewhat soon if people were interested in a mass spec video that would go through all of the mass spec stuff. But today we're just going to focus on magnetism um, and probably electrostatics because we have extra time. Yeah, no worries. Um, I can tell you like in a nutshell what M plus one is. M plus one is basically the M is the, I like the, it's basically just an ion that hasn't fragmented. So it's the actual molecular mass. The plus one is an isotope of that because if you have like a carbon atom, in it that's say not C12, but C13, the M plus one, the reason that you get the M plus one is because one of the carbon atoms was like a C13 instead of a C12. So it just has a molecular mass that's one bigger simply because it's an isotope. And you can have an M plus two for that exact reason as well. Um, but let's see, okay. 
any questions about magnetism? That was all I had planned on covering because a lot of the like magnitude of the actual forces here is just like plug and chug into the equations. And it's really pretty straightforward. This is usually where the application tends to be a little bit trickier is generally in direction. If there aren't any questions, I'm gonna go ahead and move on since we do have extra time. And we'll begin to look at some electrostatics. Again, I'm not gonna talk about a lot of the like plug and charge electrostatics. I'm gonna say more at that conceptual level and talk about how we can begin to distinguish and keep some things straight, specifically with all those like Coulomb's law nonsense. There's like four different ones. What the heck do they stand for? Um, we'll start really big picture because I think that it's always nice to understand how an equation links with a concept rather than just having an equation that's just sort of something you've memorized that just doesn't really go with anything else. Like you know what it is, but you don't really know what it's telling you. So if we have charges, opposites attract. So these first two would be coming towards each other, while things that are the same would repel. So these things would move away from one another, and that's all pretty straightforward. And that's kind of what this shows, right? These guys are going to attract. So this is kind of interesting. We had this situation where these guys were stationary, and now all of a sudden, these things are moving. So what does this tell us about a couple of things? Force and energy. Well, in order to take objects that are at rest and cause them to move, they have to be acted on by some force. So we know that there is going to be an attractive force that is between these that are between these two things. As well, they went from stationary to moving. So we can kind of see the stationary standpoint as potential energy and the moving standpoint as ki uh, kinetic energy. So there is also a transition between one type of energy, potential energy, into another type of energy, kinetic energy. And the amount of energy that these things end up having in terms of potential energy, which is what scientists like to describe, is going to depend on whether we're dealing with attractive stuff or repelling stuff and how far away these two different distances are. So let's just kind of think about this here for a moment. Let's think about some other objects that have to do with energy that attract one another. I'm thinking about a ball that's being attracted to the earth. So for example, we can imagine that we have that typical ball on a hill type situation. So here is our ball. This is like the earth and they are attracted to one another, just like the positive and the negative charges would be attracted. We can maybe say that this guy is like the positive and then the earth will be like the negative charge. So this height right here, or in our example, that would be distance, that is going to determine how much potential energy we have because potential energy is equal to mgh. So what does this tell us about the attractive type of situations? Well, as the H increases, our potential energy must also be increasing. So the farther two charges that would normally attract one another get from each other, the more potential energy they have. So for example, if we look at this, which I'm going to erase, this is a little bit cleaner, and then we'll call the one that we looked at first scenario one, and then we'll look at the second one down below, which we're gonna call scenario two. We can now determine which one of these would end up having more potential energy. So this is scenario one and scenario two. So we use this idea of the MGH and it's like the ball in the earth. We know that as they get farther apart, they have more potential energy. So one would be like the low potential energy condition and two would be like the high potential energy condition. What would this mean about the velocities as they get here? Well, since we tend to just take our stationary potential energy and convert it all the way to kinetic energy when we get to that end, right? If we're thinking about the example with the earth, it's like we think about max kinetic energy is right before the ball hits. And this is the exact same here. Our max kinetic energy is right before these two things touch one another. So in this case, I would expect these to have lower velocities because they didn't have as much energy being put in. And here, I would expect these to have higher velocities. So we can sort of see how it all kind of fits into something that maybe we understand a little bit better. But this is no longer the case when we have a scenario where we're repelling because we can't use the example that we did before where we were looking at an, um, the earth, right? Because the earth doesn't repel objects, it just attracts them. So a better way of thinking about these is going to be like a spring. So for instance, when we're looking at this, I want you to imagine that there is a spring between these two things. When these positive charges get really, really close, it's like we've taken the spring that was maybe this big and we've compressed it down and we've made it this big here. 
Whereas before, right, we had a spring that was this exact same size. It was like this big. We only compressed it a little. So it's a little bit smaller to fit between these two. And we can imagine just kind of conceptually who would end up imparting more energy when we let go? Well, I'm imagining that the tightly coiled spring would be having more energy. It's like our higher potential energy. And this would be like our lower potential energy condition. So when things that repel one another get closer together, they have more potential energy. And when they get lower, they have less potential energy. Any questions about kind of the concepts and what we're dealing with here? We're going to see how this translates over into equations in a little bit, but hopefully this gives you a sense of both the fact that there can be energy between different um, charges as well as there is a force between these different charges, whether that's attraction or repulsion. Cool. So... Typically, let's say that we started off over here on this right-hand side. I'm going to go ahead and label this guy as one. And we put all of these charges really close to each other. What we would expect is that because they would repel, they would do their very best, assuming they can't escape the confines of what we see, to transition themselves over to this because they want to put themselves, as f they want to get as far apart as they possibly can. Um, this can only happen if we are on what is called a conductor. So only conductors will allow things to spread out. If this was an insulator, the insulator situation, you would just be stuck at number one. So even though we know that things attract and repel, those forces are only gonna cause movement in certain types of materials. Those types of materials are called conductors, whereas insulators, even if you have these forces, essentially nothing will happen. We can also, and this is the last thing before we actually look at some of the equations, the last thing that we can do is we can describe the fields. And fields are kind of made up, right? So if you think about a force field in, say, like a Star Wars movie or some other sci-fi movie, those are made-up entities. They are hypothetical things. And that is the exact same thing in physics. Fields are a hypothetical construct. They say, what if? What if I put another charge near this charge? It doesn't say, hey, there's two charges next to each other. It says, what if I put a charge near this other charge? What would happen? What would I expect to occur? And what scientists have decided to do is put some directions to these charge, uh, to these charges um, for the electric field lines. And for positive charges, I say that they are positively radiant, which is to say that the uh, field lines radiate outwards. They point outwards from them, whereas they point inwards towards negative charges. This means that when things are attracting one another, their, uh, their electric fields will essentially point from one to the other. So this is what we would expect to see for things that attract. This is going to be different when things repel. When things repel, you're going to essentially see what I call clashing. So for example, in this case, these would both be sort of pointing. It's like they don't want anything to do with each other. They're just always going to kind of do their own thing, just like this guy here. They're not cooperating to form a continuous line from one to the other, as we would see in attraction. And then if this was positive charges, it'd kind of be the same thing, or it's very, very similar, except the arrows will actually clash because they will be pointing into one another in this case. So that's kind of going to be some of the differences that we see in fields. So how does this translate over to that like big mess of the four equations? Well, we're going to start talking about this. So previously, we had described the idea of real versus hypothetical. So in the real situation, we said that we actually have two charges. So anytime in those equations you see something like Q1, Q2, you know that you are dealing with a real phenomena. And so this would be like any of those things that we drew out that was this guy here and here, or this here and here or this situation between these two. On the hypothetical end of things, on the other hand, this is where we're saying we just have one charge and we're gonna just sort of say like something happens with those things. And that's what we were looking at when we were looking at the field situation. So for example, we had this and it was positive, so it's positively radiant, it's cheesy, but it always helps me kind of remember it. Or if it's negative, it's going to be kind of sucking all of those rays in, like this here. 
So anytime you're dealing with a field, right, you're going to be dealing with a hypothetical and you're only going to have one Q. So just one Q. But if it's a real value, you're going to have two Qs, Q1, Q2. For, there's an, also a difference, as we were seeing before, between forces and between energy. So for example, when we were describing the negative and the positive charges, we said that by virtue of their positions, we could describe some sort of potential energy difference between these two. But we also said that there was going to be some sort of attractive force, and we can also describe this force. And this is where we're going to get into these equations with Coulomb's law and all that jazz with either an R squared or an R value. So for R squared, we're going to be representing Newtons. And if we're looking at energy, this is going to be Newton meters. And the reason that this ends up making sense is that these end up being in the denominator. So for example, if you have an R squared value, you're going to get rid of two meters in this top. So we would expect there to be one less meter value in the force side because we're dividing by two meters. Whereas on the energy side, I would expect since it's only an R for there to be an extra meter. So like, for example, what you can imagine is that this is meters squared on the bottom, or we could say this as like meters times meters. And then up top, we could see this as being like newtons times meters times meters. And here in this case, right, these guys would both cancel. The top doesn't change. Like this would still end up being newtons times meters times meters. But in this case, because it's R on the bottom, it's just one meter. And so we'd only cancel one of these out and this would be newton meters. If you know your units, a newton meter is also a joule, which ties back into the idea of energy and at least helps me remember that it should just be an R for energy and an R squared for force. Okay, so how does this help us, right? Like, how does this help us with the mess of the different equations and figuring out what they are? Well, here we can see that so long as we know which is which and when we're mixing and matching, we'll know which equation stands for what. So let's go ahead and kind of go through these and break them down systematically. So when we look at this one, we're going to always have that k in. That's just a constant. We have a q1 and a q2 value. So what this tells me is that this is a real situation. This is either going to calculate an actual force or this is going to calculate an actual potential energy, not some theoretical you know, field nonsense, an actual value. So that's our first piece, is that this is a real idea. And on the bottom, we have an R. So we know that this will be an energy value because if it was R squared, it would have been a force. So what is this calculating? This is calculating the electric potential because it's going to calculate the potential energy between these two things. Okay, well, what about this calculation now? Well, in this circumstance, we only have a single Q. So we know that this is a hypothetical because we don't have two actual charges. We just have one and we're gonna say, what if we put another charge near this? And since we're dealing with R squared here on the bottom, this is gonna be dealing with the forces. So hypotheticals we call fields. So in this case, this particular equation would be what I call the force field equation. Okay. You're, that's not like a real thing. There's not a force field equation. If you were to open your books, you'd be like, Chris, you're crazy. This doesn't exist. Nope. What they call this is they call this the electric field. So the electric field is the force field. It's the force of what if we put another charge next to this charge that we already have. All right. What about this guy? So now we have KQ over R. So we have just one Q. And again, this is going to be a hypothetical. Ooh, it's not a Y. There we go. So this is a hypothetical situation again. Down here, we have one R. This is an energy value. So now we ask ourselves, what would happen or what would this be? Well, this is a hypothetical or a potential energy field. And again, you would say, Chris, you're crazy. There's nothing that described a potential energy field. And you're right. We call this a voltage. It is talking about the change um, in potential energy in theory. So it's not talking about an actual potential energy between things, but it's talking about a potential energy in theory of what if we had a particular charge that we placed near this charge that we do already have. And then that leaves us with our last combination, which we'll go ahead and walk through again. We have a actual real scenario. So we're going to be looking at an actual force or an actual energy. And this R squared is going to correspond with a force. If this is the case, then we must just be looking at the electric force between two particular particles, and that's exactly what this would be. This would be an electric force. So this is how I kind of keep 
these four straight. And hopefully this kind of gives you a nice scenario of sort of describing what these are also trying to explain. Because I know when I learn these, I learn these as like four separate things. We just talked about one in sequence and sequence and sequence. And I was so lost and I was like, field, energy, what's the difference? I don't understand. This is sort of my framework for hopefully making this a little bit clearer. And essentially at the end of the day, all you really have to do is just sort of focus on these differences, the real versus the hypothetical, the force versus the energy. And you should be able to figure out which equation you need to use based on how the question is phrased, as well as the units you need to end at with um, or at the end of the day. That was all I had for today. Um, hopefully that was helpful. If anybody has any questions, I'm open to going ahead and taking them now if there was something that you didn't understand or if you came across something and you're like, hey, Chris, I don't understand this, but you didn't cover it today, please let me know because I'd like to go ahead and see um, if there's anything that I can clear up for people. If not, no big deal. Um, and other than that, if, if people are going to head out, if they don't have questions, I do hope that you have a good rest of your night. As always, this recording will be posted and it will be up at, um, after the fact. So if you weren't able to make it or you did just come right here near the tail end of this session, don't despair. You can still watch the recording. And I don't see any questions as of right now. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and call this session. Hopefully this was helpful for everybody. Um, and that you have a wonderful rest of your night. Bye.